Okay. I'd like to talk uh, today about a little bit of uh, work that we've been doing on real-time learning. Uh, there's a lot of people interested in this lately. Let's get the... Uh, yes, right slides. So uh, these slides are already up on SlideShare. They'll be up on the uh, Berlin Buzzword site very shortly, I'm sure. But what I want to talk about is how can we do real time and long time together. Dan talked a little bit about how these recent streaming k-means could be used in real time, but that doesn't necessarily help us if we want to process also a very long archive or multiple scales of time where we need to reset these. Uh, there are other things that we may like to do where we decide our analysis has changed, so we need to catch up the real time against long time while we're still processing in real time. And so we have this problem. We have two very nice tools, at least two tools. We have Hadoop, which is very nice for long time batch computations. And we have tools like Storm or S4, which are very good for real time. But neither is good for what the other one is good at. Hadoop is just by design not good at real time. And Storm is, by design, not intended to do batch, large-scale computation. And so it sounds like this is a, a terrible thing, but as in always with computer science, it's not actually a problem. It's an opportunity. We have the chance to become famous. And here's the, uh, the, the picture of the problem. We have a timeline. It goes from very long ago to very much now. And we have the most recent full period of analysis. Might be one hour, might be a day. That's the latest full period. And then it takes some time after the end of that for Hadoop to get its job done. And that means Hadoop can process, uh, if, if right there is now, Hadoop can process all of this green region, but it leaves this red region unprocessed. It cannot process the, the last full uh, section until that full section is finished, plus time for it to do its work. And so we have that missing bit. And what we would like to do is have Storm handle that last piece and to exactly butt these two analyses together. It's not good if we overdo this, because we'll have overcounts that suddenly resolve. We will have situations where the, the number of unique people for the month in the middle of the month goes down if we overlap these things. If we underlap them, if, they, if there's a gap in there, we'll have similar inexplicable things. We might have a traffic pulse. We see a lot of traffic for the month. Suddenly we see none. And then we see it again as it crosses the gap. Neither of those are very good solutions, especially if our boss is looking at the statistics. And, and bosses and CEOs have this unnerving tendency to wake up at 3 in the morning and go look at the statistics exactly when the gap appears. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Uh, and so what we want is a blended view between this real-time thing and long time, and we want that blend to be perfect. We don't want any gap. We don't want any overlap. So the trick is, how can we do that? One traditional way is people... Uh, put some sort of search engine producing logs and then a consumer, and then they glue the NoSQL thing du jour, Cassandra or HBase or something like that, and they say, see, we have real-time processing. And we throw the data into a big pile so we have long time. But there, there is no sense of accuracy in deciding what's in the NoSQL database and what's in the long time database. You can do long time queries and you can do real time, but you cannot join them easily. There is no provision for that boundary being well-defined. So we have these problems that simply dumping things into a NoSQL engine is just not sufficient. And very often, the insertion rate is bounded so that we can't deal with that. We don't have load isolation. So if one part gets too busy, it can't do load shedding and catch up later. And the scan performance is typically relatively low as well. We might very much prefer to have flat files and it's very difficult, as I said, to set boundaries. Now, 
recently there's been a lot of talk about something called the Lambda architecture. Lambda architecture conceptualizes all of history up to the current moment as a single very large data element. And we think of every version of that history, starting, say, you know, yesterday, yesterday plus one hour, yesterday plus two hours, each version of that history as an immutable object. And it's usually kind of true that, that the past is immutable, especially if we wait a little while. But then there's some function of the past, everything up to now, which is defined, and we want to compute that. That, that's the general framework that you do. Now, that's infeasible to recompute on the fly in one second some function of all of history if you have to look at all of history. And so the lambda architecture decomposes this computation into uh, the fundamental layer and a speed layer, which is kind of the very last most cached bit. But it provides no provision for making this but splice, this connection between real time and long time, be seamless. It provides the intuition that this is a good thing, but it doesn't really provide the crux of the architecture. So it needs more work. And if you talk to people at Twitter or something, and you ask them about this, they say, oh, yeah, you know, the statistics do strange things, but it's good enough for now. It really depends on what you're doing. If you care about accurate numbers, that's not good enough. It is good enough as a first cut, but not as good as we can do. So let's take, in the simplest case, counting. And let's, let's work out an architecture which gets this exactly right. And counting is a very nice thing. I mean, partly because people want us to do it, partly because for people like me, it's incredibly difficult to do correctly, as you saw with the books recently. Counting to four, uh, I missed. It was difficult. <laughs> but, uh, but the nice thing about counting is it exhibits properties, associativity uh, and commutativity, which allow us to de decompose counting into pieces. It's an online algorithm. It's, it's very nice that way. And so if we build a good architecture for counting that really does work correctly, then we should be able to generalize it to any associative online algorithm. And there are some very interesting ones. The streaming k-means is, is, is an example of that. So here's the rough idea. We're going to start on the left where the data sources are. We're going to throw them into a queuing layer. And the queuing layer merely provides us a little bit of elasticity so that we can be doing uh, maintenance downstream without losing data upstream. And then we'll put it into a proto-spout, meaning proto-buffer spout, uh, a storm construct, a thing that reads data. We're going to log it because we always log raw logs in, in big data world. We're going to also pass it now to the counter bolt. And the counter bolt is the beginning of the boundaries between real and long time. It is the real time part of that, and it will keep logs internally. It will acknowledge tuples as they come through, and it will send uh, semi-aggregated values for the data downstream into another logger. And here is where the boundary between long time and real time is. It's at this snapshot. So we will make a snapshot of the data. We're, we're aggregating it bit by bit as we go by, keeping a log, and somebody will snapshot that. And inherently, because of the way the snapshot works, the last moment in the snapshot will be apparent because the last semi-aggregated point in that snapshot is in it, and the one after that is not, if we have a correct snapshot. And that defines our boundary. So let's focus in first on the counter bolt. How can we make this work correctly? Well, let's focus in earlier on the catcher protocol. This is not a big deal. You can say hello, you can, you can log messages, the cluster of those is felt tolerant because they will forward. You can cache the results and then redirect. The protospout is simple. It simply reads from files which have been appended by the catcher. And now the counterbolt. So the counterbolt takes incoming records and it, it holds on to them as quickly as possible. It puts it into a replay log. That log is persisted and is appended to so it's very fast to write to. And as soon as it's persisted to the, the, the log there, 
it can acknowledge that tuple upstream inside of the uh, inside of the spout. That gives us a replay st semantics, which is safe. Anything that's in the replay log, the counterbolt has taken responsibility for and will work even over failures and restarts of the counterbolt. Anything that has not made it into there, the storm architecture must resend if we're to get it. We can also put hashes on those so that if things go into the replay log multiply, we can handle that correctly. The counterbolt then will also periodically drop out the semi-aggregated results. And at that moment, it will start a new log for replay purposes. And the invariant there is that the semi-aggregated results have the aggregations up to a certain moment in time, and the replay log, the live replay log, will have all transactions beyond that time, not aggregated in pure form. And so what that allows us to do is restart by looking at the last semi-aggregate and then replaying from that point and, and then start handling things. And it also means that the, the replay log will always stay quite small. Those semi-aggregates are what get snapshotted, and that snapshot divides the long time from the current time, and all of the data in the snapshot is, by definition, long time. And the semi-aggregation strategy means that we can take only the semi-aggregates in the long time, we can do any sort of long time analysis we want, and then we can reliably combine with new semi-aggregates that were not in the snapshot, and finally the replay log. So in a very short time, we can get any arbitrary, associative, and online algorithm computed against all of time. And it will be a perfect butt splice. So the guarantees that we have are that the counter output is relatively small. And uh, that's because it's counting. And the aggregates are counts. Counts are one of the best compression mechanisms there. Uh, the persistence must provide certain guarantees. It has to be a right consistent medium. Now, sadly, that leaves out HDFS, but since I'm wearing a red hat, I'm allowed to say that it leaves in the MAPR implementation. And so that's good enough for that layer. Uh, we do have to have some layer that provides good persistence guarantees, good writability guarantees, and good flushing guarantees. Uh, the presentation layer now is fairly simple. It takes the last of the long time, the latest semi-aggregates, and it replays the log itself to get a composite view. That was the blended view that we wanted at the beginning. And so that's the basic idea, is that online algorithms allow this aggregation type behavior to be done. They allow quick replays against that last aggregation, and they allow aggregates at least if it's an associative online algorithm, aggregates to be combined. And that, if we can do this with counting, we can do this with any of these other algorithms. And there are a number of them. So we can do it with k-means clustering. We can do k-means clustering back to any degree of time. So that would allow us to define that we want, say, k-means clustering of any time period, say within five minutes resolution, from any time in the past, years ago, up to the present time, or any point in between. That's difficult to do in a fraction of a second with any other approach. We can do that with other things. We can do count distinct. The hyperlog log algorithm or the, uh, the, the, the k min value hashing algorithms give us an associative count distinct operator where we can store the state of that KMV or the hyperlog log and we can combine those in an associative way and we can add in new transactions. Those are the requirements for the replay. So we can do how many uniques were from this five minute thing three years ago to 10 minutes ago in a very, very short amount of time in, in basically log of the total time if we have a pyramid scale of aggregators. And the time should be less than a few hundred milliseconds, which again is, is stunning. We can also do top k values. That's trivially associative, as long as we have some bound on k. We can do the top k of count star. What are the most frequent elements? This is an approximate operation. What we can do an approximate, what are the top 
k for any time period over long time or real time or any blended thing. This is kind of cool, that, that we could do these things which would normally take queries that would take hours like that. Any one of those can be done, implemented in this way. And we also know that as the data ages and moves from real time into long time, we'll get exactly consistent results relative to what we want. And of course, in the part two of this, what I'd like to talk about is a very exciting sort of real time learning called Bayesian bandits. Even that, because at its heart, it has counting as its internal operation. That's the learning that goes on in that algorithm. Even that can be applied long time, real time, a little bit of time. Young and naive models can compete with old and wise models, and we can restart those accurately at any time for any time in the past. So any questions on the first part of this talk? So it makes sense, I think. Somebody in the back. I'll, I'll try to repeat your question. Yeah. What happens when, that's the part I heard. So he asks, what happens when we get new data? Well, we start new semi-aggregates. Well, we don't drop it. We store it into the, the file system. And, and so when we restart that and store that one, and we build a new semi-aggregate, later we can recombine those because of the associativity of the online algorithm. And, and get a combined result. Or we can add some of the replay log and get those things accurately set up. So it, it's a straightforward thing. But, but those get reset to zero at every micro time period. And then we will eventually, probably using a MapReduce, megify those into longer time periods. So he keeps saying, the, the final one overrides, no. Each one is stored in a separate location. So the, the semi-aggregate for 10 minutes ago is stored in that location. The semi-aggregate for five minutes is stored in a different location. Every semi-aggregate is stored in its own place. They're not overwriting, they're appending. OK. So let's move in. So now, the next question is, let, can we do something more interesting than counting? Counting is kind of boring. People can do that. People can do count unique, things like that. But what about A-B testing? Can we do that? Or what about contextual learning, which allows very advanced targeting sort of operations? Can we do that with this combined real-time and long-time format? Now, if we're going to do learning, we have to start talking about probability and so on. Now, it may be that some of you can predict what's happening before, but that's because you've had some training. So if we're going to talk about probability, the simplest thing to talk about is coins. OK? This is a coin. This is a 50 cent piece. And I'm going to ask for audience consensus here. What is the probability of it coming up heads? 0 0.5, 50%. Sounds like the same number. OK, that's good. That's good. Now, that's partly because you don't know that it has two heads or not. That's heads, so that's good. The probability of heads is at least non-zeros. It's heads again. That's cool. Heads again. Now what's the probability of heads? Heads again. What's the probability on the next flip? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. These, these people are very difficult to convince of anything. Heads again. Five times, no big deal. Heads again, seven times. Whoop, heads again. Tails, tails, OK. We just were unlucky. So, so anyway, here's another question. If I ask you when it's before I flip it, it's before I impart momentum to it, and so it's got this uncertainty here. But after I impart it, when it's, oh, don't throw it up so high, excuse me. I'll be able to see in a moment. Uh, I'm very lucky to have caught that. But when it's in the air, let's just do this as a thought experiment, what's the probability of coming up heads? Isn't that already determined? Because you know it's, it's flipping, and my hand is in one place, and so on. Isn't it already determined? Would the probability be different? 
0.5, the man says. What about after it's already landed in my hand? It is one way or it is the other. What's the probability of heads? He keeps saying, you know, this hedging. He doesn't actually believe what he's saying. He says, according to the current model, 50%. What about somebody have a strong opinion? 50%. Thank you. I like that sincerity. Heads. Uh, but it was already determined. But you still said 50%. Now, here's another experiment. I flipped it, and I look at it, and I ask you, what is it? How could that be? I looked at it. I know what it is. But what would I say? Would I say the same number? No, no, not at all. OK, one just last time. What's the probability of heads? Be, be bold. 0.5. What's the probability of tails? 0.5. What's the probability of something else? OK. So, now, we have a philosophical conclusion here. Without telling you this, I have just converted you all to Bayesians, those of you who were not. I apologize. Your parents may be unhappy with me. But you are all now Bayesians because you all seem to agree that probability expresses how much we know. If I knew and you didn't, you still said 50%. Once I showed you that there was no coin, you changed your answer. This is very good. This is very adaptive. This is very human and reasonable behavior. It's only unreasonable in the 1920s in Cambridge. And so you are now all Bayesians and agree that probability is expressed as a subjective sort of thing. And more than that, I think that you begin to express that you, it could be over a whole range. Initially, if you didn't really know what a coin was, and I asked you what the probability of heads and tails was, you'd go, I don't know. And you would kind of say, anywhere between 0 and 1, this horizontal axis is a probability. And then the vertical axis is, what's the likelihood you would answer a certain way? And it could be anything. If we did five heads out of 10 throws, not 10 throws out of 12 or whatever, then you might say, well, I think it's kind of in the middle. If we did two heads out of 12 throws, you might say, oh, I think that the probability of tails is higher, but I'm still somewhat uncertain. Now, if I asked you for a specific number, you would do something like an average. There's the mean of that thing, approximately. That's where that vertical line is. That's the single number that you would give me to minimize your chance of error. You know, there's a big thing to the left, but a long tail to the right. And so you would kind of fit something in the middle there. But that single number denies the uncertainty. It, it, it says this is a single point. But you agreed that it wasn't a single point, that there was uncertainty in there. And so even if we put error bars on this sort of thing, we still don't really understand from the error bars and that mean what that distribution looks like. The distribution is better described by me asking you several times, what's a plausible value? So you might say, oh, 0.4 is plausible. But you would more often say something like 0.2 or 0.05 or 0.17 or 0.27. You might give me, if I just said, give me plausible values one after another, you might sample from a random distribution with the correct distribution according to the evidence you've seen. And that would give me the idea of the actual distribution that you have in your head much better than a single number would. And that's the crux of this algorithm. We want to find the best of any of the options we're presented with the best alternative web design, the best thing to give to you, the best top in ranked comments to show on a blog, the best ad to show somebody. We want to find the best of any of these. With uncertain information, we don't have much data yet. And so we have something like that. But we know that the information that in these distributions, in our uncertainty, is distributional. So this algorithm says, Compute the distributions based on our experience. 
and then sample the probabilities that we will get something or sample the expected value. Don't estimate it, sample it. And so if we go back here, sample it means give me some value from 0 up to probably less than 0.6 with the centered kind of bulk of it in that middle part. So sample P1 and P2 and pick the one that has the highest sample. This is a way of converting an uncertain thing that encodes distributional information into a deterministic algorithm so that I can give you one ad to see, one presentation of comments on a blog, one thing that you can then give me a yes or no whether you like it or not through your actions. That converts uncertainty into deterministic testing in a principled way. And in fact, against one of the highly accepted things, this is a Bayesian band at the gray thing there. The, the, the score vertically is called regret. And as you might guess, up is bad. And this is a Bayesian bandit with very, very weak assumptions. It's just saying, you might get a reward with something between you know, 0 and 10 to the 15th sort of size. And in fact, it's a 0 and 1. If we'd given it stronger knowledge of the world, it would have cut that error even more. And epsilon greedy there is one of the ones that's commonly recommended for this sort of problem. And it's about four times worse in terms of total accumulated regret. And, and as I said, you can make that even better. So here we have a very simple, how many lines? four lines of algorithm that beats most of the best things. I have a video if anybody wants to see it. Do you want to see it? Yeah, good. Uh, this video will show one of these things working and show it learning. Assuming that the QuickTime player will come up. There it is. Okay. So, this is very much like what we saw before. This horizontal axis is probabilities from 0 to 1 of converting, of getting a positive result. And let's make this, there we go. And so initially, we have five different alternatives from purple, blue, light green, yellow, and red. Red is the best. It's the furthest to the right. And after just a little bit of data, we have very uncertain estimates, except that purple and green have never shown us any success in a few trials. And red has shown us a few successes and a few failures. Yellow, a few more failures. And uh, yeah, blue is kind of in the middle here. So at this point, if we sample from yellow or red, Either one could be bigger. It's very unlikely, however, that purple would be the best alternative. And so down here, this represents how many of the trials, what the probability that each trial will be offered, red, yellow, green, purple, and so on. And so we see that yellow has already got a fair bit of bandwidth, red is up there, and purple has very little. This is the regret from that earlier slide. It's declining as we learn. And watch the system learn. So at this point, it's learned that red and yellow are up here, and the others are all down there. And so it's giving very little bandwidth to anything but blue. And red and yellow are duking it out. Red has a slight advantage. And the regret has decreased substantially. Now we can see. Yellow is making a quick run. It, it, it passed red for a moment. We see the statistical noise in the sampling. And you can see that red is getting most of the bandwidth, which is good. Every so often, you'll see blue take a small kick because it'll change. It'll get an opportunity and learn a little bit. The uncertainty on red is decreasing because it's getting most of the bandwidth. The uncertainty on yellow is not decreasing very much because it's not getting very many tries. And the idea here is that the system is testing the possible winners far more than the very likely losers. So it's optimized its cost of learning against its uncertainty. And at this point, it has very little uncertainty left. 
it's almost certainly red, something like a 95% chance it thinks that red is the best, and a 5% chance that yellow is the best, and a negligible chance the others are better. Now this, this sort of algorithm, we could throw a new option in there at any time. It would have high uncertainty, it would get traffic for a little bit, and it would either be eliminated because it's worst, or it would survive. And it could, we could take alternatives away, we could have contextually appropriate things. Sometimes we'd only allow blue and green because people are only allowed to see that. So this sort of algorithm can learn these things very effectively. Let's go back to slides. Here's the R code that generated those images, except for the part that generates the images. I mean, this is the part that learned. Uh, and right up here, right here, is the learning. And very nicely, it's addition. And because it's addition, this whole thing is associative and online. So we can do this exact same form of learning in that same form of modified Lambda architecture, which has these wonderful properties of exactitude and perfect transition between real time, long time. So we can do these sorts of learning over any sorts of time periods we like. And the basic idea for this new learning algorithm is that it can be, you can encode a distribution by sampling and that that can give you key, key uh, optimality results. And also very exciting is that you can extend this to much more general response models where I know about you, the guy who's yawning in the front, and I know where he comes from, uh, where his browser comes from, and I know other things about him historically, and that provides a context where I can make a much more complex learning algorithm. And that complex learning algorithm could be run partially in long time, partially in real time, so that I can use this architecture to do that. Now, we may need a little bit more complicated things. We may need context about time of day and source and content and all, but this all still works. And so this real-time architecture can be used to train some, some very complex systems, like an optimizer for content or recommendation engine. And it can do it long time from one second out to years time frame. So there's the, the contact and such. Late tonight is early today, so that's nice. I usually have to say it's tomorrow. But in this case, it's already up. 